circling back to to statins here, given that that's where most of the the randomized controlled trial data is and is where typically most people would begin when it comes to lipid lowering therapy. Do either of you have a view on, and I I know that you do because we spoke about it previously on the first part of this, whether someone should start with a low or moderate or a high intensity statin uh, regimen? And also, how do you think about the the different statins, hydrophilic versus lipophilic in clinical practice. Let me take that, and then Dan can correct me <laughs> with all the, the textbook evidence and everything. Listen, uh, I think it's pretty much known in the year 2025 with respect to lipoprotein disorders, it's all about lowering ApoB as step number one in your therapy. Whether that be lifestyle or drug, you got to b- drop ApoB to a much safer level than what you might already have or so. And I think it's irrelevant how you do that using FDA approved drugs and the recommended lifestyle that perhaps a nutritionist might suggest. So uh, therefore, uh, what Dan said, why would you not start with either a zetamibe or a statin? Because they're free. In my medicine 3.0 practice, you know, Simon, and Dan has had me heard me say this before, that we do check the biomarkers of cholesterol synthesis versus absorption to try and help make, aha, you're an azetamide candidate, hyperabsorber, you're a statin candidate because of hypersynthesis. So that might be one way of doing it. But I think those are the first two drugs to start. I also believe that low-dose statin plus zetamibe has the same ApoB-lowering potency as the highest dose of any given statin. There's been any number of trials showing that. So why would I want to escalate a higher-dose statin, which definitely brings, although there are... It's not a lot of side effects. They do bring more side effects to the table than rather using a low dose. You know, five milligrams of resuvastatin, <laughs> you can get an ApoB lowering of 38%. That's right out of the FDA package insert. So my goodness. And you throw a zetamibe on that. Now you're approaching 50% uh, lowering of that. So that's my approach to low dose combination therapy. Whether you want to go one drug first and then the other, I think if the ApoB is high enough, it's pretty much wise and you know how what percentage drop you need at ApoB or LDLC to get the goal that you're chasing. Combination therapy day one makes a lot of sense. So that's the, to me, the uh, proper approach in the year 2025. You know, very few of the patients we see in real world First of all, you would have to have a master of every clinical trial ever done saying, what was the entry criteria for these trials? And see if the patient you're talking to fits the entry criteria for any of those. And that would drive you nuts if you try. So if you don't do that, you're not really doing evidence-based medicine. So that's my approach. you got to improve the clearance of ApoB. That's the only way to reduce atherosclerotic heart disease, or that's the first step to reduce it. And uh, that approach is pretty good. It works very well. And only in the more difficult cases or the super higher risk cases do you have to even think about a third line drug to to add to the situation. And Tom, do you have any any specific things to say about this idea of hydrophilic versus lipophilic and statins crossing the blood brain barrier or not? It's very interesting because I just uh, was going back and forth with our friend Simon Kelly and Neotis on this because this is, always comes up in neurologic uh, discussions, the blood-brain barrier. And look, if you're doing pharmacokinetic studies, I take one drug and give it to somebody, like I give Atorva a lipophilic statin to somebody, and I give Rezuva a hydrophilic statin, the Atorva will get into a cell quicker than the hydrophilic statin. But that's pharmacokinetic stuff. I believe once you're on a steady state on any statin, they're going to get into every cell in your body pretty much, including crossing the blood-brain barrier. And there's actually been, you know, it's post hoc uh, data on uh, at least three trials of the neurologic issues with dementia. Do uh, If statins prevented, is it the hydrophilic or the lipophilic ones? And there we found zero difference in any of those trials where they have substantial number of people on both of them. I also say uh, this, listen, statins uh, get into... Uh, 
muscle cells and, and cause myopathy. But every statin gets into muscle cells and cause myopathy. So there's nothing unique about hydrophilic or lipophilic statins crossing cell membranes or blood-brain barriers. The, of course, he mentioned the uh, bempedoic acid. That's activated in the liver by a drug, but they, it can penetrate. Bempedoic acid can get in and out of other cells, but it does nothing to any other cells. So I don't buy the hydrophilic, lipophilic stuff as much as I once used to. I think it's a cool academic talking point. You're writing a paper and you want to sound smart. You can stick that in there and you can find all the references substantiating anything you want. So to me, it's much ado about nothing. Tom, I, that reminds me of a question that we actually received following our last episode. And you've very eloquently, beautifully explained in previous episodes that all cells throughout the body produce their own cholesterol. And when we're talking about knocking down LDL cholesterol or ApoB, what we're really talking about is bringing it down in circulation in in the blood. And you've you've mentioned that we don't need to be worried about the cholesterol levels in cells and the cholesterol being important for production of things like vitamin D or being important for cell membrane fluidity because the cells look after their own cholesterol production. The cells are not relying on circulation and the liver to get their cholesterol. But when it comes to statins, if statins are getting into all of the cells throughout the body, do people need to be worried about the cells being able to produce enough cholesterol for things like vitamin D, for things like cell membrane fluidity? That's an excellent question, Simon, but here's the counter uh, uh, argument to that. If a statin gets into some other cell in your body and it is inhibiting cholesterol synthesis, which that cell needs, Dan talked about that the liver is the master organ upregulating the most LDL receptors, but any cell in the body can upregulate an LDL receptor. So in a circumstance where, say, a statin is shutting off cholesterol production in some renal cell, that renal cell can upregulate a, full, a few LDL receptors. And in that circumstance, pull in circulating cholesterol, which would therefore negate the statin-induced cholesterol synthesis within any cell. The problem is the brain. The brain cannot upregulate regulate an LDL receptor on the blood-brain barrier and pull in LDL particles. So if a statin, which can cross the blood-brain barrier, is inhibiting synthesis in the brain, that's another whole issue there. So that's what I would say to that. And this is why study after study has shown that statin therapy and even some of the other LDL-lowering drugs do not impair steroidogenesis in adrenal glands or gonads. And because those glands have other sources of cholesterol. The, the steroidogenic tissue can delipidate HDL particles and gather all the cholesterol they need. In a real pinch, they could even themselves upregulate a few LDL receptors and pull in some LDLs if they needed it. HDLs are their first choice there. So uh, again, you just can't hurt anybody with statins uh, because it's inhibiting cholesterol synthesis. You know, in my podcast, and I happen to do one on desmosterol this morning, where I, there's a theory that if you oversuppress cholesterol synthesis in the brain, of which desmosterol is a biomarker of, then that's a whole nother story. But that's a niche story, and it's a hypothetical story right now. Tom, does bempedoic acid cross the blood-brain barrier? I know, Dan, earlier you said it's very targeted. Do we do we understand if bempedoic acid affects cholesterol synthesis in the brain? It cannot, even if it does cross the blood-brain barrier, because Dan uh, told you that there's the enzyme that changes the pro-drug bempedoic acid into the active drug only is in the liver. So even if bempedoic acid crossed the blood-brain barrier and got into the brain, it would do nothing to cholesterol synthesis in the brain. The monoclonal antibodies cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, so PCSK9 is not going to affect them. I do not know about inclycerin. I don't have the data because that's an SIRNA inhibitor. It's not a It's a still a very substantial molecule if you've ever seen what inclycerin looks like. So I don't know whether that's a fair. And I just found out last week at an, an NIH meeting I was part of that obesetropib uh, cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. CETP does exist in the brain, but obesetropib cannot inhibit CETP in the brain. So that's good news to know about that drug. I can say a little something about enclizoran. Uh, you know, it's carried in lipid nanoparticles. And there's that's a, true. a specific, that. yeah. Yeah, there's a specific hepatic receptor ligand found on those lipid nanoparticles. So the drug is selectively taken up actually by liver cells 
and is gone from the circulation within 24 hours of its of its administration, sort of sucked up by liver cells. And people listening to this, we're not a adversarial team right here. Uh, Dan is much more up to date, and he's uh, he's had higher officerships than I've ever heard in any society. So he's uh, well more aware of all the ins and outs of the guidelines and why they decide on what they're doing or not. Whereas I'm just using a lot of anecdotal experience. I've read all the trials. I've learned them throughout my year. You know, they only came every couple of years. So I was able to study them all as they came out. And by my stage of the game, I just have my own warped opinion of how to do things or so. And I do them. But I think it's very good if you're having me on to have a Dan on too, who can bring it back to earth a little bit. And at least uh, for those who want to be as evidence-based medicine as they can, you hear both sides of the story here. So I think we're a really good team on this, Dan. I do too, Tom. I, I think balancing when you rely too heavily on physiology can be, it's a great conversation piece, by the way. I find in the clinic, when you dive into the physiology, you engage the patient more in what's going on. If they understand what they're doing, they're more likely to continue and follow through with the plan. And it also helps you understand whether this is the right thing to do for someone in the first place. So I really like to engage our patients with physiology. As you know, we can all twist physiology a little bit to make our hypothesis sound very true. So uh, that's the, the problems with that rather than relying on the Mendelian data or whatever RCTs we do have. But uh, the world needs uh, both approaches and uh, come to a temperate meeting. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health, and I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1,000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.